Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. My name is Josh Davis. I'm Tommy Shane. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, please email us, actually, at... Uh, uh, it's curofdemocracy at gmail.com. That's my old email. Uh, I'd like to make sure that people can contact us directly if they're not um, uh, interested in being public about it. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can catch us live on Mondays at 9 o'clock uh, at uh, youtube.com slash user slash curofanarchy. And that's again at 9, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific. And uh, we then take it and add graphics, and we post it onto Voluntary Virtues at youtube.com slash user slash Voluntary Virtues. Um, so, yeah, Thomas, we have a new guest. Hey, it's about time. Yeah, yeah. today we're joined uh, not by Corey Hastings, but we're joined by our uh, special guest, uh, Michael Freeman. Michael, how are you doing on this lovely evening, sir? Good. What's up, guys? How are you? I'm glad to, uh, glad to be on. Yeah, thanks yeah, for coming good. on, man. We could, we could use a fresh perspective on here. Um, so tonight, on tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, our main theme is going to be uh, the military industrial and com com uh, the military industrial complex, war profiteering, and then also the flip side of that, uh, media manipulation and fear mongering, and how the media kind of uses uh, disinformation, misinformation, and fear mongering to kind of keep people in the dark about what's going on and to manufacture, uh, you know, public opinion about, you know, what's really going on and to hide the, the, the reality of it. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go into the, the basic idea uh, of the military-industrial complex is it's essentially, uh, it's like a global, uh, would you call it a sub-economy, I guess? It's, a it's basically a global economy of uh, all these, these uh, corporations and, um, you know, uh, private businesses who uh, essentially make a whole lot of money off of wars, uh, especially, you know, U.S. wars, and uh, uh, make a whole lot of money off of basically they're profiting, they're profiting from, you know, human misery and human death and... Uh, Basically, so the common sentiment is in America is a lot of people th think that basically, so we're always, you know, the U.S. is engaged in these constant, uh, never-ending wars with, uh, you know, if we're in Iraq or Afghanistan or, you know, it's, if it's Syria or if it's Libya, the story might change a little bit, but the basic idea always stays the same, that there is this unknown, unseen, uh, you know, imminent threat to our, to our safety and to our liberties as a country, and if we don't go over there and uh, bomb these people and, and you know, have send our military over there and stuff, that uh, something really, really bad is going to happen. We don't know for sure what it is, but something bad is going to happen. It's going to be a threat to our safety and our freedom. So we have to go over there and uh, take care of this threat. Otherwise, you know, something bad is going to happen. So most people, based on the fact that when it comes down to it, the only people who really understand what the government is doing and the only people that are really in the know about what the government is doing are the people involved in the government, the higher-ups, not, not just because technically police and soldiers are involved in the military, but a lot of times they don't even really know what's going on. They just know what they've been told. Same goes for you know the average citizen, the average American citizen. So what they have to do is they rely on mainstream media and corporate news outlets to, you know, ref reflect this truth for them and to let them know what's really going on. Uh, and the sad truth of that is that, you know, the media is, a lot of people call the media the fourth branch of the government because all, you know, they, they embark on these misinformation and disinformation quests for the government to essentially cover up their corruption, cover up their their uh, agendas, and to, like I said, to keep people in the dark about what's really going on. So what ends up happening is, you know, everybody goes along with, so, you know, they're, right now the current threat is ISIS. So uh, ISIS, where's ISIS majorly in uh, Syria and uh, parts of Iraq and that, you know, regions like that. So... Um, the media will tell people there's this there's ISIS there's this terrorist organization that you know they're beheading journalists they're they're terrorizing people they're beheading Christians and they're and they're coming for you America they want you America 
they're already in your cities and they're already in your towns and they're already in your states uh, and, and they have training camps set up in every state and they're, they, they're coming for us and they, they're, they're going to kill us and uh, basically you need to give up your, your consent for the government and its military to do whatever it needs to do to take care of this threat. And uh, you know, the really messed up part about it is you don't know if that's true or not because there's no way for you to know because you can't rely on the news to tell you what's real or not because the news is on the take, the, the media is on the take, the media is helping them cover up what's really going on and keeping you in the dark. So basically that's what I want our theme to be for this show is uh, you know, people who profit from wars and people who benefit from, from wars and how the media helps them to cover that up. And uh, that's why I wanted to have Michael on as a guest because he is actually served in the United States military. He's been to the Middle East, uh, and he can offer some insight onto what's really going on and how, you know, reality doesn't correspond to what the media will have you believe about what's happening. So, um, yeah, Josh or Michael, you guys want to kind of just open this up a little bit and. Michael, yeah, I know you've, ahead, told Michael. Me, you've told sure. me before that everything that you hear on the news about what happened about the Middle East is bullshit, so... More or less. I mean, I think everything you hear about the news in general from paid media can't, can't be taken with more than a grain of salt. No matter what, they're going to shed um, a certain light on the people that they represent. And this is a bipartisan thing. This is a nonpartisan thing. They're going to represent the state 100% of the time, of course. Now, ISIS, um, I think ISIS is convenient for, for the state right now. We, we've, we've wanted Syria for a good couple of years. We've clearly wanted Iraq since, I, I say, 1980s-ish, right? Um, so you remember the weapons of mass destruction? Because I don't. Do you remember, like, okay, no, first, do you remember not them being, in, them being um, at fault for 9-11? I don't. Or the weapons of mass destruction. Or the third nonsensical reason that I can't even spring to mind right now. I just don't pay attention to any of it. We want Iraq, and we have for a really long time. They're going to say whatever they have to to get it. This is the next boogeyman. There's always going to be one. Mm -hmm. you know, if evidence points to the fact that we may have created them, or at least funded them for a while, and helped, helped them achieve what they... or I guess there's a debate for whether they've achieved anything, but help them become what they are, if they exist at all. That's what I think. I haven't been, I, I, I've never dealt with these people in, in real life. I can only take what the media says and what I find on alternate sources, and both sides are... Nobody knows. No, none of us know. I, I totally agree with your point. Yeah. That's one thing a lot of... That's a, uh, it's a conspiracy theory, I guess, but I, for one, I don't think it's nearly as crazy as a lot of the other conspiracy theories about the fact that uh, the theory that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are both CIA sock puppet organizations. They're basically manufactured threats. And this isn't new. Anybody watching who's not, who, you know, is not really deep into this sort of thing, they, they're not up to speed on the military, they don't know what the military industrial complex is or anything, fear mongering, they don't know about that sort of thing. If, uh, this isn't new, this isn't a new, these aren't new tactics that we're looking at here, this is old, this is, this is you know, so these are some of the oldest tactics in the book. If you, if, so if a government has, let's take uh, Afghanistan for example, this is a perfect example, Afghanistan is rich uh, with, with uh, minerals, minerals that are used in a lot of things, you know, t they're, they're, they're made to build uh, computers and iPods and that sort of thing. They're, they're minerals that are worth a lot of money. Uh, they also contain, they also possess 90% of the world's opium supply. Uh, so if a government were, you know, if they want to, if the United States government says, hey, look, if we, if we can get in there, if we can get Afghanistan, if we can take control of that, we will essentially be taking control of all these resources that could, in turn, make us uh, disgusting amounts of money, obscene amounts of money. Uh, the only thing is, we need, you know, we can't just tell the American people, well, look, we're going to go over here and invade this country and risk, you know, human lives just because, you know, because of the financial incentive behind it. So what they need to do is they need to, they need an excuse, they need a threat, they need to be able to demonstrate to the public that there is this imminent threat there 
that if we don't go in and do something right now, they're going to be at your door ready to behead you, or they're going to be coming in. I saw a thing today that was, that was saying uh, threat of ISIS coming in, ISIS and uh, Ebola infected ISIS jihadists coming in from Canada in here. So basically using fear mongering, scare the shit out of people, make them think that there's this imminent threat to their safety and their freedom, that you've just made your excuse to go into that country. And uh, the sad thing is if you use the media to perpetuate that fear, not a whole lot of people are going to ask questions. They're just going to say, yeah, well, you know what, if this is, you know, if that's true, yeah, let's get in there. Let's let's do whatever we need to do because I'm all, I'm all, I'm all about keeping me and my family safe. And uh, if these jihadists are over there and they want America and they're coming for us, then we need to get in there and do something about it. So meanwhile, the military goes in there, seizes control of these resources, uh, there you go. That's a lot of money right there. Same thing with Iraq, with the oil. Um, I'm not really sure where the politi where the incentive is in Libya, other than maybe political incentive. I guess political incentive can be just as useful, you know, gaining political power in an area. But for the most part, it all revolves around either resources that they can make money off of, or political power which they can exploit later on for any number of reasons. You know, it never hurts to have power and influence in other countries. So, Josh, what's your uh, what's your perspective on all of this? Well, I guess I'm thinking about two things. Um, control, like that that is what it is. It's like political power, you were saying, and yeah, it's just a matter of control. They just, uh, but it's not just uh, America that wants America to get in there for these resources. It's, you know, this I don't want to be a conspiracy nut, as it were, but, you know, there is this overwhelming idea of a world government, you know, c coming about over the last hundred years and everything, and I do see it being ap appropriate to the conversation, And um, but it's not just that. It's, um, it's I, I think that the reason, not it's not just about resources, I think. I think it's also about... Um, the more that they do this, the more that they have to do this, because then uh, they'll give up all of uh, their uh, their personnel in the army and the navy and such, and um, people will lose faith in the government, as it were, because they'll see that it's for naught, and thus the value of the dollar will drop and you have an economic collapse. That's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, we got a little ahead of ourselves. I just want to go over real quick. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we got real ahead of ourselves real quick. For, um, Did not know like that. Anybody, watch, anybody, who watching, anybody who's, who is watching who doesn't, who is not familiar with the military-industrial complex, it's a sub-economy of basically... I already, I already went over that, didn't I? A little bit, yeah. You know what their industrial complexes. Okay, well, uh, it doesn't. It also it doesn't just apply to the government. It also applies to. Uh, there are a lot of corporations who, you know, pe corporations who uh, are either they manufacture arms, they manufacture technology, they manufacture armor, that sort of thing. Uh, there are a lot of companies and a lot of people who make a whole lot of money off of wars. They have a direct financial incentive to be in wars because they profit off of them directly. So without these wars, they're not, you know, peace is not financially, it's not, it, it has no incentive for them. They don't want peace because they're not going to be making money off peace. They need war. They need perpetual war. And a lot of these people are in bed with the federal government, either directly employed in the federal government or, you know, they've, they've purchased legislation, they have congressmen in their pockets, or that sort of thing. So that's basically the military-industrial complex, which is also uh, a prime example of fascism, the partnership of corporations with the state, corporations using the state uh, to do their bidding for them. Actually, Thomas, uh, we got a, a text in Facebook uh, from Brian Richards. Oh, okay. Uh, he says, uh, I wish I could listen in live, but my phone won't let me. Uh, damn you, Bill Gates, he says. <laughs> I was wondering if if you guys have heard of neuro-linguistic programming and neuro-associative conditioning. I have not heard of that. I don't know what that is. I'd have to look that up. 
neuroassociative conditioning to me sounds like uh, it sounds like mental persuasion. It sounds like uh, using su using uh, um, subliminal psych psychology to persuade. That's basically what the media does. It uses subliminal messaging and suggestive thinking to change your perspective on reality. Yeah, just obey us. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's like if the government is if the government is saying, "Look, we're doing this for freedom. We're doing this for your freedom and to protect you." Um, if that's all you're seeing on TV and you don't bother to look into it for yourself, why would you ever question it? You would just, you know, there. Are, I mean, I, that's a that's actually a dumb question. Why would why would you question something you saw on TV? But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there are uh, so many people that are like that that think that the news media is reality and that that's, you know, that CBS told me this or CNN told me that or Fox News told me that and that's the way it is otherwise they wouldn't be telling me that because they have no vested interest in lying or manipulating me they're they're gonna be real with me they just want me to know what's going on actually did you hear about the Supreme Court ruling uh, against not against Fox in Fox's in Fox's favor that it's not against the law to lie on television that news media has no legal obligation to tell the truth. They can blatantly lie to you, which I'm not advocating that there should be a law about it. But yeah, right. That just goes to show you right there that why why would they be even bringing that up unless they were lying to you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which at least they finally told you the truth for a minute. <laughs> yeah, that like defeats the whole purpose of media. Wasn't journalism initially supposed to be? To, to balance the government, to keep the government in check. They were going to report on what the government was doing so that you knew about it. I guess, I guess they overlooked that small possibility that the government would just buy the media and use them as a mouthpiece. And now the media is just government mouthpiece. Right. You know, whether but it's MSNBC or Fox News is inconsequential. It's just to, it's just, you know, it's all a show. It's all an act. People should know that, and you know that's why a government shouldn't exist. Actually, that's a great case for it. That's yeah. a great case. Unfortunately, or, you know, people like you and I know that, but unfortunately, we seem to be in the minority somehow. Somehow, intelligence is in the minority. Anyway, so let's talk about how basically how the media uses fear mongering and misinformation to per, to uh, distort perception of the Middle East and to gain support for wars in the Middle East by, you know, basically lying to people and ex distorting facts. Just, I guess just give us a little bit of insight onto, I, don't, I know you don't want to talk about war stories, I don't want any war stories, just uh, your perception, basically what you were expecting to see versus what you actually saw and then how you were like, you know, this isn't what I was told on the news. Sure. Well, um, I mean, most nationals were always nice to me. Most, the ones that I interacted with, maybe not some of the more bad guys, right? But uh, a lot of the, lo the locals on the fobs and, and, and whatnot, you know, you <laughs> some of the first tastes, other than like buying marijuana as a kid, some of the first tastes of free trade that I ever had was was with with these people, right? And um, yeah, you know, they, they're just going to, they always paint it to be big, big bad X, uh, always, since, well, to be quite honest, I don't really know what I feel about World War II at this point. Um, I'm the same way. It's, it, it's a, you have to understand that it's a paid media. Like I said earlier, they are, they are the, the mouthpiece of the state. Yeah. You know? it, it, it is the way that they operate. And you know, you, you mentioned the military industrial complex. I would like to add in. You didn't mention power one time. Like, like war is the power is the, the the energy of the state, right? They want war always. It's great for their money. It's great for expanding their empires. It's great for taking you know what little rights people have left away from them. It's great for the state. You know, to quote uh, Butler, you know, war is war is a racket. It really is. There, I don't think there's ever a good guy. Ever, I, I don't think there can be. When you're slinging bullets at people you've never met before, you know you're you're kind of a bad guy on both sides. I think maybe there are just small altercations that are, you know, morally, subjectively accepted. But in the scheme, war is always bad, in in my opinion. Yeah, I would I would totally agree that you know, seems like most of the time. Uh, 
war doesn't really, you know, when it all what it all boils down to, it doesn't really seem to have anything to do with justice or morality or or freedom or anything. It usually tends to be you have something that we want and, you know, we're going to take it by force. And if you put up a fight, we're going to label you terrorists and we're going to kill you and your families and your children and, you know, and we'll, we'll portray it on the new. When I say we, I'm talking about America, and I hate saying we when I'm talking about the American government, but, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a reflex at this point. But, you know, they, um, like you said, yeah, the, the media, Josh and I were just talking about uh, the media was supposed to be, you know, journalism is supposed to, it's supposed to keep people in check. It's supposed to remind people that, you know, it, it does matter what you do behind the scenes because we will find out about it and we will write about it and we will out you and people will know. And that's what it was supposed to do for government. It was supposed to keep government, I know it's an oxymoron, keeping government honest, but it was supposed to, you know, inform the citizens that, look, this is what is really going on and that this is what you're not being told about. And, uh, you know, obviously that just creates an incentive for, you know, the government will just buy the media and it will become a, a mouthpiece for the state. It will become their, it will just become, the media has essentially become their propagandists and that's the opposite of what it, you know, the, the purpose that journalism is supposed to serve. That's why I think journalism is such a joke now and I think people that pursue careers in journalism, at least mainstream journalism and that sort of thing, I think it's just a joke because you're just, you're not, you're not reporting reality. You're you're a propagandist. You're a you're a spin master. You're you're taking corruption and uh, you know greed and lust for power, and you're and you're twisting it and distorting it and manipulating it and trying to make it look like something beautiful and something virtuous and pure and something about freedom. And that's exactly what they're doing with ISIS, and it's the same thing they did with Al Qaeda. You, you manufacture a threat, you make it look like this evil, this embodiment of evil, and it's coming for you, and it's, you know, you never know, you don't know when, but soon it's going to be at your door, and uh, it's like, what are these people really? Are they even real? Is this even a real thing? Is this, is this legitimate? Is this made up? You know, you don't know, and that's the, that's the whole, that's my whole perspective on corporate media, and I don't understand how people, how anyone anywhere still believes that corporate media is an accurate reflection of reality, you know. I, I want to jump in, and I think it's a matter of uh, people just accept what they know, like they are used to um, watching TV, watching the news for lunch and at night. Uh, during dinner or something, and it's, you know, they like the fear. You know, they learn to love being scared, you know, and uh, I think it's a, uh, that's why so many uh, scary movies actually are, um, you know, get such good ratings every year, you know what I mean? But uh, it, it plays into the emotion, and people like that emotion, and uh, and that's a good thing, you know, to a degree, but um, I don't think people think it through, and uh, you know why are they scared about it? Why do they like being scared? You know what I mean? Um, but uh, it, you know, it it also plays into you know they grew up on watching television and watching the news every day, and it really was uh, news at one point. You know, at least a little less biased than it is now. You know, but now it's full-blown and I can see it you know plain as day most people can or most of us can you know but um, I guess I'll stop there but it's just like people like being scared I guess is what I'm getting at you know what I mean yeah and they also like the us versus them mentality they like the they uh, I watched a video um, Joe Ro anybody watching Joe Rogan has a video on YouTube if you just type in Joe Rogan military industrial complex it's a, he does an amazingly accurate description of the military industrial complex, the us versus them mentality and where it comes from. And I'm going to quote him on this because it's just a perfect, it's an accurate portrayal. Uh, he's saying that, you know, Americans, they like to get together. Like, they like to get drunk and they get rowdy and the testosterone starts flaring and they go, yeah, you know, 
these motherfuckers over there, they, they think they're going to do this, and, you know, we're Americans, we're the biggest badasses on planet Earth, we'll go over there and kill them all, and, you know, this and that. It's like, that's how people get recruited. That's how you get recruited. That's how you get used in the military-industrial complex, is that us versus them collectivist bullshit mentality that, you know, it's all about, you know, taking pride in things that you haven't done and hating people that you've never met. And that's what nationalism is, and that's what a lot of this boils down to, is people rallying together over a common cause, and, you know, they get all amped up about it, and they don't care about logic or reasoning or what's really going on. You know, right. if, you know, if you try to bring up the Islamophobia thing or anything like that, they just, you know, they call you a liberal or whatever like that. Because you're yeah, like God that. forbid somebody think critically about you know what you know God forbid you think critically before sending you know a hundred thousand troops over to kill all these people you know for no reason for for money yeah. for financial gain. What's the actual difference between you and an Arabian? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> the whole natural. <laughs> bigger badasses and we're going to kill these people because uh, the government said, you might as well be a Nazi, you know. That's exactly yeah. why the Nazis flourish so much, because of that exact same mentality. People buy into it. It's emotional. It's, it's emotionally charged, and people eat that shit up. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Um, you're talking about the difference between a Saudi Arabian and, and you. Damn it. Uh, geography, that's about it, you know. You to, to quote the king, you didn't build that, right? Um, so, yeah, to, to touch on, on something Thomas was saying about... That's my dog, my girlfriend just got here. She's yeah. going to gonna handle him, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, me. So, um, to touch on what Thomas was saying about... Actually, I have, I have a few good points here about um, the, the real media, the true media, right? I think that's legitimate media at this point, independent media, is um, the only check and balance that exists within the government, right? We all know how internal investigations go. So, so yeah, there's that. And second, um, what you were saying about people joining the military, um, how you were saying about the nationalism and the believing in flags and all this nonsense. Um, most people that I know, and in my case especially, I joined the military for money. You know, I joined the military for school benefits and, and a steady paycheck. Yeah, once I was there, I, towards the end I believed that, like, the Middle East should be turned into a Walmart. But, uh, yeah, mo I think most people join for, for totally selfish reasons and don't really care about the the politics. They also don't consider the fact that they're going to go kill people for no reason. Okay, so a perfect example of the op... Wait, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect example of the opposite of that, though, is um, I'm not going to name him or his relation to me because somebody somewhere might be watching the show who knows him, but basically, I know someone who he's, he, he's been a Marine for over four years now. Uh, actually, he's currently in Afghanistan right now. Uh, he was telling me that uh, he wasn't telling me. He he told he he made it very publicly known that the reason that he joined the Marines in the first place was that he wanted to kill people and get away with it and not have any consequences for it. Doesn't matter who he was killing or why he was killing them. He just wanted to kill them and not have any repercussions because of it. Uh, he's now over four years into his service. Uh, last time I saw him was uh, around Christmas of last year. And, you know, I try to remain cordial and friendly with him, which is really hard for me, considering that I know, you know, the kind of person that he is and the things that he's told me. And it's really hard for me not to just strangle him right where he stands. But um, he told me that his, his ambitions when he gets out of the Marines is to either, um, he either wants to join a Blackwater-type uh, black ops organization or he wants to be a cop and I blatantly asked him I said you know you know I told him flat out you know the kind of things that those people do uh, and basically I flat out asked him would you fire on Americans not that that matters because you know there's no difference between a peaceful American a peaceful Saudi Arabian a peaceful Afghani any peaceful person anywhere but I basically 
asked him, would you fire on Americans? And he said, yes, in fact, I already have. So this will give you a little bit of an insight. And also, if you anybody watching, uh, I highly suggest that you go, if, you have, if you're on Facebook, go and add, uh, it's called Shit Troop Supporters Say. They will share with you a lot of statuses that are actual statuses and actual posts of current and ex, ex and current military members, uh, the things that they say, and it gives you a really good insight onto the psychopaths that are serving in the military right now and what their true motives and agendas are. They want to kill. They want to torture. They want to maim. They want to hurt people, and they don't care why. And that's why it's just absolutely disgusting to me when people say that support the troops or support the, the war or support the military or anything like that because you are supporting terrorism. You are supporting psychopaths who want to kill and hurt people and end life. They want to take human life away from people for, you know, basically no reason. Either, you know, either they, they disagree politically or religiously or... They just want to kill people because they're different, because they're a different race, they're a different nationality, and that's disgusting to me. And that's what anyone, and I don't care, there's no excuses to this. If you support the military, the United States military, you support terrorism, you support murders, you support psychopaths. You know, Michael, I'm sure you can, attend, you can attest to that. Did you ever meet anybody like that while you were in the military? Did you encounter anybody like that? Yeah, and I would you know, immediately ostracized. Okay, at the time, I, I, you know, at the time, no. I, I thought very differently than I do now. Um, nowadays, if I met somebody like that, I would ostracize them immediately. I would not, hurt, I would not interact with them um, on any level or any, any way, shape, or form. It's tough, though, when you come to the person who does believe that what they, they are doing is just and moral, right? That's where it gets kind of tricky. Do I want to just get this person away from me because... Yes, maybe they kill and and invade and all, all this stuff, but they believe that we're do they're doing is good, right? So I I don't want to throw them out entirely. But then again, when you kick in doors, intentions kind of go out the door. I think. Um, yeah, it's t it's just it's really tough. And the veteran, you know, as far as I don't want to say converting people to anarchy because that's just the wrong way to go about it. And, it's counterproductive. You need to come to these ideas on your own, I think. But maybe helping them figure it out, that's one real tough cookie to crack. Yeah. Josh, um, and Dad? Yeah, I mean, my thing is, um, I'm not trying to convert anybody here, but it's happened on this show. I mean, or even in the other show, like, I converted people to liberty, you know, when I was a minarchist. And then I converted myself, basically, you know, through other um, information, uh, other sources. Uh, so I converted myself to anarchism. And uh, it's possible. It, I mean, you don't, you know, call that the goal, per se, but you, it happens, you know. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll go with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... I the um, um, the whole militarization and Blackwater thing, it's like, uh, it's it's scary, man. Like, when you're talking about um, people trying to just get into these big groups, you know, as a business, and they have the intent to kill, and they like it, it's weird. Like, if a government didn't exist... I think these vigilante kind of groups would still exist, but it wouldn't be to the extent that they are right now, and they wouldn't be covered up. And, you know, they'd be known a little bit more, I think, uh, because the news wouldn't be um, bought out, you know, to the degree that they are right now. I think they, there would be a lot of collu uh, collusion or whatever, but it's it's sick to see that you know people actually like to kill just to kill or whatever but you know, i guess you know the, you have the axe murderers and everything and they just like to kill to kill or whatever but they they should be either put in jail as in right now or they would be um ostracized and 
put to death or something. It, I just wish, you know, um, there was a little bit more anarchy, <laughs> as it were, you know, because it, it's so um, convoluted and uh, corrupted and everything right now. Uh, I guess I went on a big tangent right there, but um, yeah, that's what's going through my mind right now. It's all good, man. It's uh, exactly what we're talking about. Blackwater is a dis is a disgusting abomination of of humanity. And the same goes for all those. You know, I'm not opposed to private security and that sort of thing. Obviously, we would need that right. in free society, but. When you're a private security organization that t you know basically works for the government or works for corporations that are protecting assets over there, and you're essentially you're just basically you're 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 like you know I know the U.S. military they're paid killers, but Blackwater to me is like the military-industrial complex on crack, like that is the embodiment of evil in my opinion, in my subjective opinion, but. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just crazy the 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 distortion in people's minds that so let's talk about you know government government and freedom you know government uh, likes to operate under the guise of freedom they like to perpetuate wars under the guise of freedom and the whole thing is so you know asinine and it's an oxymoron to to think of uh, government you know government facilitating freedom or war for freedom, you know, it's just, it's an oxymoron, it's ridiculous, like, that's not, that's, that's nationalism, and that's not freedom, that's, you know, that's collectivism, individualism is freedom, collectivism is just being enslaved, it's the enslavement of the individual for a collective purpose, and, um, like I said, you know, and I know, it seems so simple to people that are already into the idea, you know, people that are already libertarians and anarchists and people that are already, you know, there are a lot of people that are already aware that the media manipulates information. The government lies and covers up shit. The government does. The government doesn't serve the people. It serves the investors. It serves the corporations. It serves, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh... It's just crazy. I guess it's crazy that that black and white area between you're either completely and fully aware of that, or you still watch Fox News or MSNBC and you still buy into all of it, and you still and those people, you know, if if, if somehow one of those people stumbled upon this this web show, somebody, you know, an MSNBC or a a Fox News supporter, or a, you know, basically a status, shame on you. Shame on you because you're perpetuating this. You are the number one cause that is, you know, continuing us on this path, this path of death and destruction, this path of people who, like Michael was talking about, there are people who join the military because they think what they're doing is right. They think that, you know, they buy into it. They think these people, you know, if I don't, if we don't do something about that, they're going to come and they're going to hurt my family and they're going to hurt my friends and they're going to hurt my neighbors and I'm not going to stand idly by and watch that happen. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ante up and I'm going to join the military and I'm going to go do something about that. And I, you know, on, on one hand, I commend those people because, because they, they, you know, good for you for wanting to protect others and wanting to, you know, fight for those who can't fight for themselves. But on the other hand, you know, those people are just being taken advantage of, and and so too many times they're being sent to their death. They're being sent to their imminent death, or they're being blown up, or they're being mutilated, or you know, they're 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 coming back paraplegics. They're coming back maimed and scarred from war, which is, you know, hollow for no reason. For no reason, they're risking their life. They're risking their safety for no reason. Their families. Are you know there that affects them that affects their families that affects their friends that affects everything, and it's all bullshit. And so many people just let it happen because they refuse to see the truth. They refuse to look into things for themselves. They just keep watching Fox News, you keep watching M MSNBC, and you keep buying into the bullshit. And you don't. You're just becoming a part of. You're not becoming a part of the problem. You're perpetuating the problem, and that's disgusting to me. And it's you know that's that's why I say people who you know you either support human life and you support freedom, or you support government and war. There's no. It's not. There's no two ways about it. You don't support both. You don't support government and freedom. You support government or freedom. You support government or human life. You know.
Yeah. I don't know what to say I'll, after that. I'll try. I'll try. Um, <clears throat> well, you have groups like um, veteran Iraq Veterans Against the War, or Veterans for Ron Paul 2012 was a pretty pretty big deal too. Um, and I noticed at an increasing rate, I'm messaging with my buddy like. Kind of, kind of as we speak, right? Who's who's a veteran who's watching the show right now and agrees with like what most of us are saying, you know? And uh, I notice every day a lot of the, the ones that I talk to are starting to come to the ideas of self ownership and individual liberty or whatever you want to call. I I, I like to call it market anarchy. I guess I call myself like an abolitionist. I, I think. Um. Yeah, like a lot more people are coming to the, to these ideas at an increasing rate, and and again, and, and it's a hard one knowing, knowing like believe me, I, I I fully understand what I helped to per perpetuate, right? Um, and and that's a tough one. The co the cognis is is real strong in veterans. It really is. I mean, cognitive dissonance. I'm gonna say that. Yeah. It's right. really strong, really hard to beat, and. And it, I still kick my ass over it sometimes, you know. Not physically, because I'm not going to NAP all over myself. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a real. T I said this already, I believe, but it's a real tough cookie to crack. But I think technology and just the 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 idea of fucking free sorry free trade spreading, you know, it's a beautiful thing, and the market will solve every every single one of these state problems and do it at such a better level. And basically. The free market does most of this stuff already, anyways. Like, you know, the roads argument. Who builds the roads now? Obama does not build the roads. Uh, Dick Cheney never built the road. Contracted companies do, and there would be plenty of incentive, right? If there's no government to have roads, like Sears might stay in business, and they need their customers to be able to get there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. That's what you know. Sixty percent of the road, the the original roads built in this country, were done so by uh, private traders mm -hmm. you can't have commerce without I think you have to have people to be able to transport themselves and goods and services around. Otherwise, your business is worthless. But to to kind of expand on what you were saying about that, I know a lot, uh, overwhelming amount, and I've discover I'm discovering more and more every single day, uh, anarchists that I'm friends with on Facebook, who were are veterans. So yeah. many of them are veterans. Adam Kokesh is in the Marines. He's you, he's the reason uh, he's the reason I'm voluntary, man. You, uh, Damon Damon Spillman in the Common Sense Anarchy. Uh, I believe other people in that group. Uh, so many people that I know, and they were. It's like, uh, you know, and the vet, the vet, the Iraq Veterans Against the War, or whatever. That's an excellent organization. I'm so glad that stuff like that exists, and, it, and that's why you know it makes me sad that people who believe that they're doing something for good. Uh, are being taken advantage of and actually having their lives and their 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 safety and their well-being risk, even not just in the war, but after the war. When they come back, when you come back and you try to get help, you have to go through a V. You have to go through the nightmare of the VA hospital. You know, like you were you were given. I'm sure you were promised fucking everything when you were enlisting, and then when it came time to collect on that, it's probably a different story, right? I got everything that I was promised, but there was a certain waiting period, right? Yeah. But like, one heard. thing that I will will say is cool that they do. You know, there's the whole backlog thing. You guys hear the fuzz outside? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing. Um. One thing that's cool that they do is they do retro pay you. So say I put my claim in in I don't know 2009, right? Whatever, and then I don't get it until 2013. I get paid. The entire time for what I'm um, granted, right? So a lot of people get like forty thousand bucks, fifty thousand bucks. Nice. Which that's, I, can... you know, that's a that's a small price to pay, in my opinion, for what you went through and what they risked, and uh, basically being used as political pawns. But um, so definitely, definitely being used as political pawns. Yeah. But you know, I think that it, the one positive aspect of it is military service is a real eye opener for a lot of people because, like the person who got me into anarchy in the first place, anarchism, uh, he was a marine for eight years and then he was in the Army National Guard for four years and then he was the one that turned me on to. I used to drink with him and hang out with him and he was the one that 
he gave me a book about fascism and he gave me a book about uh, the liberation in France and that sort of thing and he was the one that opened my eyes to the whole liberty, anarchism, libertarian thing so if there's one positive that comes out of military service I'd say that it seriously opens people's eyes to the military industrial complex, the bullshit you know, the media fear mongering, that sort of thing and it brings people back and, it, and you know the government have you heard of uh, Operation Vigilant Eagle? Where they watch? Um, no. It's a, it's a, it's a. I believe it's a CIA operation. It's it, they will watch veterans when they come back. They will, they will monitor their internet activity. They will monitor. They will basically watch them all the time because they're a security risk. Because. Do you have any um, credible sources to back this up? Uh, I, you would just have to Google uh, operation. Not, yeah. What's that? No, I was gonna say not. You don't have to give them to me right now, but we talk so. <laughs> No, if you just Google uh, Operation Vigilant Eagle, you'll find information about it. But uh, allegedly, the government will monitor veterans when they come back because they know there's such a high risk of them becoming disgruntled. <laughs> what? Disgruntled. No, because no. basically, they see the bullshit, and they come back, and they're like, you know what? That was bullshit, and now I'm fucking pissed because I just risked my life for that shit. Now I'm at, you know, and they become anarchists and libertarians and stuff, and, and they, they, they go out and they talk to people, and I think that's a perfect example. Uh, that's a perfect way to, you know, basically prove that it's bullshit. If you send people over there and they come back and they hold this mentality, what does that tell you? Because they were there, they experienced it firsthand. They come back telling you this is bullshit. You know, it would behoove you to listen to them because they were just there and they saw it. And they, and it's not CNN or MSNBC. It's someone who is just fucking there in those shoes looking at it firsthand and they're telling you you guys better wake up you know and that's what operation vigilant eagle is they watch these veterans when they come back basically <laughs> i can okay. tell you firsthand if you know it the first thing about the department of veterans affairs they watch every veteran yeah. Yeah, absolutely they do they still call me on i hardly go anymore they still call me on a regular basis check in look up my files and all that but um if you want to get a really great i think i i already mentioned him but if you'd like to get a really good perspective of a long-term, 34-year active duty veteran who served in numerous conflicts on three different continents, just look up Major General uh, Smedley, Major General Smedley Butler. More experienced than than me and everybody I know put together. Yeah. Yeah, that's like right. you were saying. Kokesh was the one who got you into this. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll give you, I guess, sort of how I got to anarchy background, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, right, you know, I got out of the military, and let's say I came home, and I don't know. It, it, it kind of started with a car registration, I think. I was just like, why do I need to, why do you guys need to know, register my property? What's, what's that about, right? And anyways, I, I kind of rolled into the Alex Jones thing and, and all that crazy conspiracy stuff. Um, for a few, for a good few months, and I started to notice that it was just scary, and it just made me feel bad and sad, and I didn't have fun with it at all. So uh, I don't know. It was a gradual progression to like Rand Paul type libertarianism. Um, from him, I obviously, you know, there's the rabbit hole uh, analogy, right? From him, I fell to Ron Paul. From Ron Paul, I fell to you know, I heard, I heard, I saw Adam Kokesh, I think, interview Ron Paul, and um, then I heard about the armed march and all that stuff, right? So instantly I was looking him up. I was kind of all over the Constitution, the 3% crazy stuff at the time. Um, and then I started watching Adam versus the man, his show, and I heard all these words, and, you know, I didn't really know what they meant, but I just heard the way he talked and the way he described the insanity of this all with humor and, and, you know, just the idea is, you know, not to point guns at people. And he wasn't using all these crazy isms that, that you know, I like Molyneux a lot, but he, he's, he's extremely boring to me, right? Yeah, you need and that look charisma. Up. He definitely has the charisma. Yeah, right, right. And uh, actually, yeah. I just watched a video of his not too long ago where he, it was, a Adam, it was not Adam versus the man anymore. It's like freedom, freedom, freedom something. But uh, 
he had a guy on there. We're talking about how to be, how do you be aware of all this that's going on and still like be positive because you still have to think about your own well-being, your own mental well-being. You cannot let this consume you. You cannot let it define who you are. You still have to do your best to be a positive person and to find you know humor and and passion and love in life without just dwelling on this. You know, and he's a perfect example of that. Adam Kokesh will point out all the 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 fallacies of government and the you know the flaws in logic of government, and he still maintains a positive attitude about it, and it, he's humorous about it. He has that charisma, and that's what brings a lot of people onto it, and that's why he's like one of the first people. I if somebody's new to this and they're they're looking for recommendations to look into, I always recommend him, him or uh, Larkin Rose. You know, Larkin Rose is not nearly as charismatic as him, but he has that simple that he has that flow to it where he can just explain the most complex thing to you in the most simple way and you'll just it'll just click and it'll all fully you know it all makes sense. Yeah. So John yeah, Sweeney you, over you got, Silver you got to and, Did you? Oh yeah, pork fast. Nice. Yeah. You that cool in real life? <laughs> um yeah he's that he was he, actually he's cooler in real life. Nice. Because you know his video he comes off direct and not mean like Chris Cantwell or anything, but kind of stern, I think. Yeah. Now, in real life, he said the word dude, and he was out of school. Yeah, okay. Josh, <laughs> I think you need to go over the prices. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to uh, test this again. Uh, so this is going to be a test run, but whatever. Um so the last time we did silver was uh, uh, last time we did currency prices was uh, last week Monday. So uh, yeah, so the last show uh, silver was at 1948 uh, today. Uh, I took this price at 852 today. It was uh, 1904, so that's a drop of that's wrong. It says a dollar 44, but that's wrong. It's only down 44 cents. Uh, gold um, last time was 1286.35. This time it's uh, 1256.40. That's a $30 drop, uh, and this is still calculated incorrectly. I think. Um, yeah, that's wrong. So I gotta change these slides when I edit this. Um, anyway, um, and Bitcoin. Uh, Last time was 473.50. Tonight it was 472.17. Um, so that's only a dollar and change drop. So th at least this didn't change much. Like the last couple times, um, it was changing quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> like five, uh, what was it? Like a hundred dollar drop or a hundred fifty dollar drop every time. It was pretty ridiculous. I do expect. Uh, again, this is mid-September. Like uh, I, by the end of September, I expect these prices to go up quite a bit. Um, it's like every September, uh, like gold goes through the roof, silver goes through the roof. We don't know much about Bitcoin yet, so I'm interested to see what happens there. Okay, uh, I know. I know uh, you wanted to talk about self-defense, didn't you, Josh? Last time. Yeah, I figured it's appropriate. Um, I, I think that since a government exists, does it have the right to defend itself? You know, that's a really good question, huh? Does a government uh, exist? No. Right, well, that's a good point. I mean, it exists in our mind, at least. Um, and, well, it is... Um, uh, people believe it so much that police do have these uniforms and they use their authority um, and you know we have legislators and uh, they're creating laws but it's really just extraneous positive rules that are enforced upon the market that's not real law but um, it, it exists enough so much that um, I, it's worth a debate you know even as an anarchist you know, I, I I don't know what to say about it. I should think that the government really, it, it does exist in a sense, so I think it at least should be given, you know, um, 
it, it can't speak for itself, though, so maybe it can't defend itself. <laughs> what do you guys think? Okay, okay, no. A government, <laughs> let's pretend it exists, right? Let's just, let's, let's pretend. Um, I'd put my tinfoil hat on if I, if I had one, right? So let's pretend that it exists. A government is only force, right? Yeah, so right. how can something that's initiating force defend itself? It, it entirely defeats the definitive purpose of the word. Okay. It, it can return. It can return fire, absolutely, but no, it can't defend itself. Well, my my perspective on it is that the government, you know, self defense is is a uh, it's on an individual basis, and the government is not an individual. It is a group of people. So a group of people acting together. You know, like Michael said, initiating force. That's all the government does is initiate force. So technically, even that's why I, you know, and like the, the Christopher Cantwell uh, will talk about people, you know, uh, attacking government, attacking police, how it's not actually the initiation of force because the existence of police in and of itself is an initiation of force on you. So that by attacking police officers would actually be self-defense. I wholeheartedly support that. I'm not saying that I advocate going out and attacking police officers because you will end up in prison or you will end up dead. Uh, and you're no good to the liberty movement, dead or in prison. But, um, right. you know, yeah, like I agree with Michael. You know, if an organization that exists solely on, you know, it is sustained by violence, it is sustained by terrorism, is sustained by uh, initiating force on people, they can't claim self-defense because anything that happens to them, in my opinion, is a direct result of that initiation of force and it's self-defense from sovereign individuals. Well, okay, if they are directly aggressing against me, yes. Now, I'm just, I shouldn't really say this over the interwebs, but I don't pay taxes. Some of, my, some of what I make is exempt, but some of it is not. And I don't, I don't file, I don't, I don't, okay, yeah, I, I guess I pay when I buy my beer and stuff like that, right? But I don't I no longer pay taxes either, and we don't have sales tax here, so, cool. and I don't care. Fuck you, IRS. So, so when they come to steal the money from me or point their guns at me or something, then I am correct in defending myself. But if I just walk out and shoot a cop who's walking down the street, no. Okay, if you pay taxes, honestly, I'd say there's a different argument because you are legitimately being extorted. So then you kind of have the right to defend, your, defend yourself. Then there's the whole argument for, like, escalation of force in the NAP, and that's just pointless in my freaking opinion. Just don't point, don't point guns at people, right? Only in, in defense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would say if they're actively aggressing against you, yes, but if the premise of them doing it exists, no. But if a police officer exists solely to make, solely to enforce government policies, policies which don't actually produce a victim, so say, so every single cop that exists will uh, uphold anti-marijuana laws as long as you're not in Washington or Colorado or anything like that, or drug, let's just take drug laws for existence. Every single cop that exists will initiate force against you for doing heroin, even though you're only hurting yourself. If you're doing heroin in front of a cop, they're going to arrest you. So by him existing, uh, in my opinion, that is an initiation of force because he will. He has made it abundantly clear that if you engage in this victimless activity, they will extort you, they will kidnap you, they will throw you in a cage. Uh, and in my opinion, even though that's not a direct use of force, that is still a direct threat of use of force, which that's is still coercion, coercion which is still yeah. an, which is still a violation of the non-aggression principle, which still merits self-defense. Of course, but until you hear these fuckers right now, sorry, you hear these guys right now, until <laughs> you are 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 threatened by them for, for participating in said act, that is totally justified anyways. I mean, put whatever you want to in your body. Heroin, even a bullet, I don't care. You own yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you, until the cop is trying to stop you from smoking crack or whatever heroin, I think you said, um, then, then there's no threat posed. There's the... 
Oh, this it argument. still is. There still is a threat because they're, they're, they've made it clear to you that if you engage, if you do heroin, we will assault you. We will extort you. We will cage you. That is a direct threat of force, <laughs> which is force. Well, if you're not doing it wrong, you have nothing to hide. <laughs> yeah. What do you need rights uh, for? Are you hiding something? <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. This would be a good topic to get into maybe on another show, Michael. Yeah, like start a show with this one. If you want to come back. No, not yeah. this one. Not this not this topic, dude. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> no. If there's no way. Nobody's going to win it. There's not going to be a, 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 a cons uh, consensus, you know. Oh, Nobody you don't want to do this one. topic? This I, would never, I wouldn't do the, the subjective versus objective either. But this, the point of this show isn't to reach a consensus. It's to literally just us discussing it and actually disagreeing over it is serving its purpose. Use of yeah. force. Because at least we're, you know, at least it's it, this show is all about the viewers and anybody watching. So there might be someone who watching who agrees with you, and then there's someone watching who agrees with me. All we want, yeah, to do, I mean, of course, all we want to do with this show is engage people. We're not trying to convince anybody. We're just trying to, to engage people in thought. It's of more course, like a one-on-one -on -one show, like a class, or as it were. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not about who's right or wrong. It's just about engaging people in thought. It's about getting people to think. Um, yeah, so I, I got I, I to gotta close up the show, guys. I'm sorry. We're running out of time. Um, so... Uh, hey, uh, thank you very much, Michael, for coming on the show. I I think you're awesome, and you should come on pretty soon. What do you think? I yeah, hope so. I'll come back on. you got to let me plug myself a little bit, though. Um, so, yeah, I just run a little it. page called Don't Tread on Anyone. No big deal, but uh, I have fun with it. It's I'm, like, one of the two anarchists in this entire state. So um, I want to shout out Common Sense Anarchy 21 group. It's awesome. That's how I met Thomas, and it's really good debate. Um, and then my pal Isaac Full is watching right now, who's a veteran, and he might not fully agree with me on stuff, but but a bit. So we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I'll definitely come back on whenever you guys want, man. Cool, man. Beautiful. All right. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, take care of yourselves.